Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. We're going to open this study with a word of prayer. And dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence once again as we, we seek to understand the time that we are living in, that we can prepare for the crisis ahead, that we can receive of your Holy Spirit uh, to do a work in our lives that will glorify you. We pray for one another. You know, Lord, the burdens that we bear. We often do not consider what other people are going through. We look at our own situation. We can be impatient uh, with others. We just pray, Lord, that you can give us wisdom and understanding, that we can reveal your your character to, to those who are seeking to know the truth, that we can draw all men unto you. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, that was a really good study there, Dwight. And I mean, it, it obviously some of the things are relating to what we're studying here in uh, this book, the, uh, the Crisis Ahead by Robert W. Olson. So we had finished off last week dealing with the, the Holy Spirit as a gift, right? So we're studying that. And so we were talking a bit about the latter rain in, in, in the last study. And we're going to look at this question and the spirit of prophecy quote. Do we appreciate this promised gift as we should? Right. So how would this relate to what we were talking about? I know people who are just watching this video won't. Do we appreciate what God has done for us? Do we appreciate how, how what the price that God has had to pay, the Christ that the price that Christ has paid? In giving this gift, because we think of a gift, you know, we, we can give things to people and those gifts, you know, sometimes they they don't really they're they're just they're not expensive gifts. But in this gift, this is the most expensive gift ever given. Correct. Amen. Yeah. Or ever so, would be by far. Yeah. Yeah. So just prior to his leaving his disciples for the heavenly courts, Jesus encouraged them with the promise of the Holy Spirit. This promise belongs as much to us as it did to them. And yet, how rarely it is presented before the people and its reception spoken of in the church. The consequence of this silence upon this most important theme, in consequence of this silence upon this most important theme, what promise do we know less about by its practical fulfillment than this rich promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit, whereby efficiency is to be given to all our spiritual labor? The promise of the Holy Spirit is casually brought into our discourses, is incidentally touched upon, and that is all. Prophecies have been dwelt upon. Doctrines have been expounded. But that which is essential to the church in order that they may grow in spiritual strength and efficiency, in order that the preaching may carry conviction with it and souls be converted to God, has been largely left out of our ministerial effort. OK, so this is quite quite a, an amazing quote here. Um, any thoughts on it? I'm thinking of Acts 2, you know, that first sermon that reached many people from different nations and even some of the priests. This is what we need to be crying out for, you know, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be cleansed of everything so he can dwell in us and, and operate through us. Yeah. So, so people, you know, we, 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 we deal with this, this promised gift as if God is unwilling to give it, Right. Like we pray for the latter rain as if we're we're begging God to finally fulfill his promise as if he's reluctant to give it. Correct? You understand yes. what I'm saying? Yeah, right? So so the reason it's not given has nothing to do with God's reluctance because it's something that he wants to give. So, I mean, we're going to read more about this, but and, and we believe that this gift is connected to a message. That it's not just, you know, it's not just some magical thing that that happens, right? There's a message connected to it. God is unfolding a message to his people. 
And, and the reason why we're unwilling to accept this message has to do with our spiritual condition, right? So God can't give this gift to somebody who's not ready to receive it, right? The ground has to be broken up. Seeds have to be planted. Things have had to have grown, right, in order for this, this latter rain to come or the Holy Spirit. Even in the first place, you at least have to have seeds planted, even for the former rain, to have any effect, okay? So we're, we'll study this more here as we'll go through some of these quotes and these sentence questions. Do we have to put away all our sin before we receive the Holy Spirit? Or does the Holy Spirit help us put away our sins? This is kind of a, a trick question because uh, it depends what people mean. Um, but without the divine working, man could do no good. God calls every man to repentance, yet man cannot even repent unless the Holy Spirit works upon his heart. So obviously we know the Holy Spirit is the one that initiates the whole process. But there is a progression in which, and this would relate to the study on Friday nights in the Steps to Christ, there is a progression in which the Holy Spirit can work. When we talk about the latter rain, that's obviously not the first work that the Holy Spirit does. It is the Spirit that convinces of sin and with the consent of the human being, expels sin from the heart. So we know Jesus says, I go away and that I can, and I will send another comforter and he will convict the world of, or convince the world, convict or convince of sin, righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I go to my father and he see me no more and judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And soon he shall be cast out, Ellen White adds from another place when she quotes that passage. So we can see that there is this progression, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And, and judgment would relate to the harvest. Would, would we agree with that, with the latter rain? Yes. Yes. Anybody want to elaborate on that? Well, we know that those who who come to Christ have been called of Him, and that and there should be should be a mighty harvest. And God has been working on hearts a long time, in some cases. And finally, when they hear this message and they un they understand it, I guess in the in the fullness, in the sense that they see Christ represented within us, then then there is going to be a mighty harvest. Now, we know there are two, actually, two harvests uh, talked about in the book of Revelation, right? So it's in, just trying to find it here. Um, I always forget where that is. Oh, it's, it's, it's earlier. Okay. Chapter 14. Uh, you're going to have the harvest of the earth. And that harvest of the earth is going to happen after the proclamation of the three angels' messages, right? So it's going to have Revelation 14. You're going to have the first, second, and third angels' messages, right? And then you're going to have this harvest of the earth, right? And and what are the two harvests? Anybody know offhand what they are? Are you talking about they will look on him whom they have pierced? Or are you talking about the, the first fruits of 144,000 and then the remainder? Okay, so you're going to have, uh, here, I'll read it here, Revelation 14, uh, 14, 14, 14, I'm not studying, that's the verse. Um, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press, press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. OK, so 
we have this uh, these two harvests. So what are these two harvests in Revelation 14? Righteous and, and wicked. Well, I thought you meant like the first fruits, 144,000, and then the mm-hmm. remainder. Like I wasn't sure. I didn't yeah. think about the destruction of wicked ultimately, but of course it's in there. Yeah, and, and, and here in this, what we have is the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing profess, prophetic message. It develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers, right? Which each will be a harvest. There's, there's in a sense, two harvests that go on. We know that the wheat and the tares are to grow together until the harvest. That is, we don't see until the time that they are ripe, which are the wheat and which are the tares. And the tares, of course, you can sift the wheat and the tares together at the time of the harvest. But if you try to weed out the tares early, what happens? Take the wheat with them. I know when I've gone foraging, sometimes I get things that I don't want with the things I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so we can see why, you know, God, God uses these illustrations uh, for us uh, to understand you know, these things from nature to illustrate spiritual things. Uh, The Lord Jesus acts through the Holy Spirit, for it is his representative. Through it, he infuses spiritual life into the soul, quickening its energies for good, cleansing from moral defilement, and giving it a fitness for his kingdom. Now, um, so when we say that Jesus acts through the Holy Spirit, I mean, we know that the Holy Spirit obviously speaks to our hearts, gives impressions, uh, but primarily through God's word, right? Because people can can have impress- impressions from other spirits, and we have to test the spirits, whether they are of God or not, based upon his word. So, so it's just talking about different work that the Holy Spirit does. So the Holy Spirit convinces us of sin. It, it infuses us with uh, s- spiritual life, right? It, it gives us energy for good. Right. Without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't do anything towards uh, knowing God, right? Because that's what the question is. The question is on the previous page: Do we have to put, whoops, do we have to put away all our sins before we receive the Holy Spirit, or does the Holy Spirit help us to put away our sins? So we see that this is the work of the Holy Spirit right from the beginning. Okay, how does the miracle of the new birth take place? So we have John 3, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians 6, 11. So John 3, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right? This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, right? In verse 3, he says, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we can see that it's through the Holy Spirit that this new birth takes place as well. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. So so we understand this work of the Holy Spirit is comprehensive. The work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart can no more be explained than can the movements of the wind. A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or to trace all the circumstances in the process of conversion, but this does not prove him to be unconverted. By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, Impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. These may be received through meditating upon him, through reading the scriptures, or through hearing the word from the living preacher. Suddenly, as the spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. But by many, this is called sudden conversion. But it is the result of a long wooing by the spirit of God, a patient, protracted process. So one of the things I think about with this um, is, you know, the people that we come in contact with, you know, whether it's, you know, people we meet only once or or people that we see on a regular basis, like my guitar students, 
there is a work that is happening upon that person's heart, and even the people in church, right? How that person is responding or where they are in that process of conversion, it's pretty hard for us to tell. Sometimes we, we see somebody who's suddenly converted, a friend or something, or a relative, and, and, and it seems to us like this just came out of nowhere. But God had been working on their heart for years, right? Sometimes in their resistance even to the Holy Spirit, this was still the work of God, right? God is, God knows what he's doing, right, when it comes to reaching each individual. You know, and I know with myself, and other people could probably, you know, talk about their own experience and think about it. But I know even as a child, God speaking to me. Didn't mean I was converted, of course, but, um, you know, there was all through my life, there's just this awareness of this work of the Holy Spirit upon my life, right? It took time to bring me to a conversion. And of course, that process continues, right? It doesn't, it's not just a one time event and that's over with. A any thoughts on this? Any, any comments? Yeah, I can relate to to what what you're saying. I didn't know it was the Spirit of God talking to me, of course. I mean, I started to get an inkling when I was about 19. And I remember remarking to my boys, I, I know God is calling me, but I'm running from him. And he let me run until that rope just pulled me up short. And I was close to death and I finally received Jesus. He's still working on me. Yeah, well. Working on all of us, uh, but, you know. Of course, I maybe because my dad was a minister and I talked to God all the time when I was a child. You know, I, I was aware it was. I mean, I wouldn't have said it's the Holy Spirit. It would be Jesus. You know, God speaking to me. Uh, but I was aware of it all the time, even through my rebellious teenage years. I was still aware, you know, of God's God speaking to me. When the spirit takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. So again, you know, I want you to think about your own experience. I know for me, it, you know, my surrender to God happened when I was 17 on August 11th, 1980, uh, 187 days after I had turned 16. Which is kind of significant. Also, August 11th is significant. Uh, but uh, all of that work that God had been doing in my life, you know, the different experiences that I had, different people that influenced me. But I was fighting against God in a lot of this, these situations. Now, if I think about, well, I surrendered myself to God. I mean, we can all look back at when we first gave ourselves to God and how un-Christ-like we not were we were not just before that, but even still afterwards. So this creation of this new being in the image of God, it it happens progressively, right? I mean, it's not like everything just fell away and I was just this completely different person. I mean, in some ways I was, right? I mean, it changed my perspective and my relationship to what was happening around me. So. I saw the world differently. Uh, I didn't see myself as suddenly good or anything like that. But it gave me a, a completely different perspective than I had prior to my conversion. So any thoughts on that about this transformation in our experience? It is through the spirit that Christ dwells in us and the spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of life eternal. Right. So we can see that there is a beginning that happens at conversion, not an end. Do we agree with that? Most certainly. Yeah. So this is this relates, of course, how often do we need to be converted by the Holy Spirit? The follow to follow Jesus requires whole conversion at the start and a repetition of this conversion every day. And and that's something that, you know, was it really evident to me when I first gave my heart to Christ? Because I just kind of thought, you know, I'm converted. You know, I had this this experience and, and everything's just going to be fine. And in some ways, I, I mean, I was depending upon God making my decisions. You know, it changed a lot of things in my life at that time.
But at some point, I recognized that I had not been converted every day, that, you know, my, my life started to go in a, in a direction that I wasn't happy with and um, in the choices I was making. And so I recognized, well, I need to be converted again, right? Um, but I still didn't recognize that I needed to be converted every day yet, right? It, it, my conversions it kept happening more regularly um, as I continue to go through my Christian life. But I wouldn't say they happen daily. You know, I would, I would still keep taking everything back into my own hands at some point. And, and I think that's normal. Hopefully I'm not uh, unique in that sense. I mean, it would be good if I was unique in that sense, but, you know, not for me, but for everyone else. But do, do we understand? Can we sympathize with this experience? Can we see the need yes, of daily? It's really hard sometimes. Like I'm, I'm praying and I'm trying to reason with people who are Baptist of extraction and what have you. Like they've got this Calvinistic thing, the once saved, always saved. You only have to receive Christ once. And then I keep insisting and showing them verses. No, it, it's an ongoing thing. We need to be converted daily. How can anything defiled enter heaven? And then, of course, there's the battle is about the state of the dead. I mean, there's so many doctrinal things going on. And mm. I'm just saying, look at the scripture. Look at the scripture. What is the scripture saying? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. I, I started with that one, right? So, yeah. I mean, we're all good friends, but these doctrinal disputes keep coming up in a nice way, in a very friendly way, but they're yeah. there. Yeah, but the focus that we need to have right now is not really upon what other people are doing. It's upon our, our own selves, right? So, I mean, it's true. They need a new conversion every day, but 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 we need so it more. We. I know that. I know that so well. I'm glad I'm with this group, but sometimes I get pretty frustrated. I don't try to show it, up, but and I come back and say, Lord, please, please speak to them. Help them to have such an interest in the scriptures that these truths will unfold to them. And yeah. we don't get into this big uproar. Because I said, I want to. I don't want to argue scripture. I don't want to argue doctrine. But I'm also mm-hmm. starting to say, we need to put aside everything that is not according to the scriptures and all of these church traditions and all these false doctrines and really have a relationship with Christ. Yeah. And that's what we focus upon. So how often do, uh, let me see. It's, oh, how only can we as Christians resist the many temptations that confront us daily? So he directs us to Romans chapter eight, and that's a very powerful chapter. It's, I often call it the victory chapter, but but there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And he has defined the flesh in the previous chapter as what he is. That is, I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwells no good thing, right? So the, the, the other verses that give verse four, that the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Again, the same idea. Verse nine, uh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And verse 13 and 14, for if we, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we can see that it's through the spirit that we can overcome the flesh. Right? Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the God. Does that Apostle Paul had the need of dying daily. <laughs> yeah. He says, I die daily. Yeah. I bury about my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Right. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Um, and to impress that's in the sense of uh, 
not that we're impressed, you know, but in, in the sense that his character is placed upon the church, right? Like as a, um, a seal who actually dwells with us through the presence of the spirit. Now, of course, this is, you know, the anti-Trinitarians within uh, Adventism are, have problems with this idea of the Holy Spirit, right? But we know that the Holy Spirit is a person. Ellen White just said, the third person of the Godhead, right? But through the Spirit, Christ was able to abide continually in the hearts of his children. Their union with him was closer than when he was personally with them. The Holy Spirit is the converter or the comforter as the personal presence of Christ to the soul. So the Holy Spirit brings the presence of Christ. It doesn't bring its own personal presence, if you understand what I'm saying. Because it's through Christ, he's the one that died on the cross. It's through him that we have access to the Father. But he sends his spirit so that he can be present with us. On the day of Pentecost, the promised comforter descended and the power from on high was given and the souls of the believers thrilled with the conscious presence of their ascended Lord, right? So Christ had ascended into heaven 10 days previous and on the day of Pentecost, he descends as, as the comforter, right? So, so Christ has a body, a human body, he's in heaven, but he can be with us through his spirit. Can we fully understand this? That, because people try to use like illustrations or analogies, you know, or parables from nature. But Ellen White says we should avoid those. And why is that? Why do we avoid naturalistic uh, analogies to explain uh, the Godhead, the divinity? The just, uh, I don't think it might create confusion. Uh, yeah, because they're insufficient to to explain it. Right? right. However, you try to explain it, it's it's going to give a false impression because it is something that can't be explained. Right? There is not some comparison that we can we can use other than what the Scripture says, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, those aren't analogies. Jesus is truly the Son of God and has always been the Son of God from eternity. Right? That's what God has used to describe their relationship. But even then, in some ways, it's insufficient, right? It's just the closest that God can give us. Because in giving his son, we, we can understand how God is affected. If we try to break it down into some kind of unrelational, you know, people, I can't remember the examples on what uses of things that people, the analogies that people use and why we should avoid them. But, uh, um, I've seen people use all kinds of different analogies, but the best is what's given us in Scripture. We just need to accept it, even if we can't fully comprehend it. As the Holy Spirit makes the presence of Jesus real to us, how will this affect our characters? It's kind of an, an interesting, uh, I mean, to me, the question, the way he, he puts it, because he's he's drawing this from what he has stated before, asked before, and how he answered it. But the Holy Spirit makes the presence of Jesus real. What what does that mean first to you, the Holy Spirit making the presence of Jesus real? Christ's personal personal uh, interaction with us. Okay, but it's real. Like think about real. Do do you remember when Christ became real to you? What what does that mean? Well, I could I could recall verses. From John chapter one, that I heard at mass, and and then I had this sudden urge, just like I believe it was the Spirit of God telling me that I had to confess to everybody what Christ had just done in my life. And I didn't always choose to wisely, got me in a lot of trouble, but nevertheless Christ was preached as I knew Him at the time, and since then it's just, you know, like. Sometimes I just feel so forsaken and so isolated and depressed. And the Lord keeps reminding me, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And Lord, thank you so much for your for your presence, Lord. Thank you. You're still speaking to me. If you're still speaking to me, then I know I still have a link with you. 
I'm not lost. I'm not forsaken by you. I, I have to go through this quite often, you know. Okay. Um, so when we think about the presence of Jesus being real, I mean, in our experiences as we think about this, because um, ask the question, when is Jesus, do you remember when Jesus became real to you? You know, because we can have an intellectual understanding of the truth. A person can, you know, be raised, they know about God, you know, they they go to church. But there is a revelation of Jesus Christ that happens. We we somehow come into Christ comes into our presence or we come into his presence and and we see ourselves for what we are, right? Right. That that to me is when Jesus is real, right? Because you can have sort of an intellectual belief about, you know, sin and, and so forth. But something happens where it becomes real, right? You see yourself as a sinner. For me, you know, I was hiding in the in in darkness, right? Not wanting God, not wanting my sins to be revealed. So when Christ became real, my sin was revealed to me. So, I mean, that's why it affects our characters. Now, we got a few verses to look at. So we got a second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18. But we all with open face beholding in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And of course, we've looked at this verse many times. Right? We, we pair it up with James, where he talks about the law of liberty, like looking into uh, the law of liberty, right? The mirror. Galatians 5.22 but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, of course, this is talking here about the works of the, the flesh and the works of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. Right. So you've got the works of the flesh, all these different things, and then the fruit of the spirit, these contrasting each other. And then you have First uh, Peter 1 verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So um, so we see obedience that results. In Second Thessalonians 2.13, But we are bound to give thank always, thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through thank sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Right. So there's a sanctification, the work of setting us apart for God's holy or moral purposes and, and a belief in the truth. So L. White says in Desire of Ages 805, the impartation of the spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. It imbues the receiver with the attributes of Christ. And uh, never will the human heart know happiness until it is submitted to be molded by the spirit of God. The spirit conforms the renewed soul to the model, Jesus Christ. Through its influence, enmity against God is changed into faith and love and pride into humility. The soul perceives the beauty of truth and Christ is honored in excellence and perfection of character. So we can see that this change happens through the spirit. Uh, the spirit was to glorify Christ, that is reveal his character, uh, by revealing to the world the riches of his grace, right? That's how he glorifies Christ. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. So, dealing with that quote that uh, Dwight was uh, commenting on about something that's too hard. You know, what God is promising is it too hard or marvelous, as the King James says. You know, God is, should he give up because it's too hard? You know, God is doing this work of, of that that's impossible, right? The perfection of the character of his people. And it's a work that he is doing in us as we cooperate with him. And this is done through the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit is constantly doing, showing us that we're sinners in need of Christ. Through faith, the Holy Spirit works in the heart to create holiness therein. 
But this cannot be done unless the human agent will work with Christ. We can be fitted for heaven only through the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to elevate the taste, to sanctify the heart, to ennoble the whole man. So this cooperation between God and man that, that's done through the work of the Holy Spirit. For some people, this is just an impossible task. I mean, if we look at ourselves, it, it, is, it is a pretty amazing task if God can change us to be like Christ. I mean, that would be a miracle, wouldn't it? I mean, a true miracle to change the human yeah, heart. Definitely. And that's the miracle that has to happen. That's the proclamation of the gospel. And yet, you know, we look at ourselves and we, we doubt God's ability to change us. And yet, hasn't he been changing us? Hasn't he been working upon our hearts? We fail, right, at times. But God is not failing. He allows us to go through these experiences because they are all working towards this goal, that the character of Christ can be perfectly reproduced in his people. So this change is happening spite of the fact that we, we have a hard time believing that God can do it. Yeah, so this next chapter here, dealing with the latter rain itself. So, you know, we had talked about the latter rain earlier, but here in, in this study, we looked at the work that the Holy Spirit does, and I would characterize that the work of the former rain, much, much of that that's being talked about, right? This is the, the preparatory work for the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in the latter rain which leads to the loud cry and the proclamation, the empowerment of the third angel's message for the first time in history. Because in every line, the third angel arrives, but it's never empowered, except in our history. Has there ever been a time since the entrance of sin when God has not worked by his Holy Spirit? Well, we know that, that, I mean, that one's a simple question to answer. God has always been working through his Holy Spirit because God has always been working, right? Now, now, some people have the idea that uh, the Holy Spirit was only given on the day of Pentecost, and before that, there was no Holy Spirit, right? So I think that's partly why he's asking this question. So but we look at Genesis 6, verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for, the he that, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be in 120 years, right? Here we can see the flesh and the spirit that we saw in Romans. Um, and of course, his days being 120 years is a time prophecy. That is, God is going to give 120 years uh, from this verse until the destruction of the world by water, right, the, in the flood. Okay, some people think that, you know, that's how old they're going to live to be. I'm not sure why they would assume that since nobody's dying at 120 years. At that time. Now we have Isaiah 63, and we should be we should be aware of this. We should all know what this where this is going. Isaiah 63, verse 10 and 11. Now there's there's actually a whole section here, which uh, in Isaiah 63. So they just gave us verse 10 and 11. I'm going to start. I'm going to start at verse eight. I could start earlier, but. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So talking about the people in the past, right? But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned he, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? So the question is, has the Holy Spirit always been working upon the heart of man? According to these. So how, how do we take it? In these verses that I've read, I mean, you could read it that, you know, God says, well, you know, is the Holy the Spirit will not always strive with man. So what, what's being talked about here with the Holy Spirit? 
in these two passages I read. Well, in those times, the Holy Spirit did strive as man at least 120 years. So it, and then they were cut off. The ones who did not receive were cut right. off. But all of this through human right. creation, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God still moves upon the face of the multitudes. People like I didn't at first know it was God moving on me. When I did realize it's probably God, but I don't want to yield to him. And then, then there are a lot of folks that are at that stage. Well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Really? You know, I've met folks like that. I'm okay. I'm going to heaven because I keep the Ten Commandments. I, well, I, I will sometimes ask, what about the fourth one? Uh, are you honest in all your dealings and this and this and this? You know, if I get into a deep talk with them, you, you're not saved by your own righteousness. You're saved through yeah. Christ. He's the only hope. So, so the Holy Spirit is always striving, but God does withdraw his spirit when there's a judgment that occurs, right? If you understand what I'm saying, that that's what's being here. Like, obviously, when uh, we have, you know, the flood, right? God is, in a sense, going to withdraw his spirit, right? But, but otherwise, he's always striving with man. So Acts of the Apostles, page 53, from the beginning, God has been working by his Holy Spirit. A Testimonies 139, uh, it is the work of the Holy Spirit from age to age to impart love to human hearts. For love is the living principle of brotherhood. And during the patriarchal age, uh, the influence of the Holy Spirit has often been revealed in a marked manner, but never in its fullness. Acts of the Apostles, page 37. Now, so there is, seems to be some difference here. Um, it's revealed in a marked manner, but never in its fullness. So that's kind of an interesting, uh, what, what that means specifically. Okay, so uh, what operation of nature does the Lord use to illustrate the work of the Holy Spirit? Uh, here we're going to have one, which is, of course, uh, the rain. So we'll look at some of the verses first here. Zechariah 10, verse 1, Ask ye the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Hosea 6, 3, which of course I have as a scripture song. I have a few scripture songs from that chapter. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And Joel 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, now I would say that that um, when we deal with the former and the latter rain, it's not the, the the work of the Holy Spirit sometimes is represented by the wind, right? Because the word itself, spirit, is actually wind or breath, right? In, in Hebrew, ruach. In in uh, Greek, uh, pneuma, right? Uh, in Latin, you know, spirit, <laughs> which is where we get the English word spirit comes from Latin. Um, but they all represent the wind, right? And and we see that like in respiration, you got spirit in there. Uh, so the Latin and a pneumatic tires, of course, uh, uh, that's what they used to call tires. You fill them with air. Uh, that you got pneuma there. I don't think we we have ruach. In, in English anywhere. We haven't borrowed that word from Hebrew. But these all refer to the wind. But we also have the rain. So so what's the difference when we when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit as the wind, or we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in the rain? What's what's the difference? He hasn't made this distinction here. I don't know if people understand what I'm asking. Well the rain rains on everybody. Okay, right. 
Okay, so that work <laughs> of the wind, the Holy Spirit in the work in our hearts is, is sort of an individual work, right? Yeah, yeah. But this former and latter rain tends to be a more visible work, a manifestation of God's power, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and I'm trying to relate that to the previous statement in Acts of the Apostles 37, where it says, during the patriarchal age, the influence of the Holy Spirit had often been revealed in a marked manner, but never in its fullness. And that is, there is a specific work that the Holy Spirit does. I mean, in some ways, you could say the flood is is a representation to some degree of, of the work of the Holy Spirit or the latter rain in its sort of destructive force. I guess the question that I'm trying to, to ponder here is or the point that I'm trying to make is that we have this former and latter rain. These are, are specific messages that are given, right? Like w- there's something that happens. They happen within a time, within a time period to bring about the harvest, as we talked about earlier. So in some ways we need to distinguish this from the work of the Holy Spirit that happens upon in the life of the individual. Right? The Holy Spirit has a work in converting the sinner, but that's not the work of the Holy Spirit at the time of the latter reign. Right? This isn't the normal work of conversion. Right? The other things that we read about the Holy Spirit. This is, is a particular point in history, a particular event or way mark. Right? Because, uh, the latter rain is connected to a message, the message of righteousness by faith, but it's also connected to the loud cry, right? To the proclamation of the message in power. What is the function of the early rain, which in Palestine comes late in October and November? Well, it actually comes in December, but I don't know about October. I'm not sure where he gets that. But anyway, in the east, uh, the former rain falls at the sowing time which it does, but it mostly falls in December. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate. Under the influence of the fertilizing showers, the tender shoot springs up, right? Um, So I would put it in November at the earliest. Okay, so what is the function of latter rain in March or April? The latter rain falling near the close of the season ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle, right? So we already talked about that. How does the early rain represent the work of the Holy Spirit in the individual heart? Right. And so we could we could equate that. Right. The early rain is that first part. Latter rains another part as the dew and the rain are given first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen to harvest. So the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another the process of spiritual growth. At no point in our experience can we dispense with the assistance of that which enables us to make the first start. The blessings received under the former reign are needful to us to the end. Okay, so, okay, Angela put a statement there. Why why did you put that up there, Angela? Ellen White's first public vision was in December of 1844. Because you were, I didn't realize I was muted. You, 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 You were speaking about rainfall. When when it's falling, you can say, well, it wasn't in October, it was in December. And I thought Alan White's first public vision was okay. in December. Oh, I see. Now I see why you're, why, why you're putting that there. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think about, like, uh, in Nehemiah, is it, uh, it's going to be in Nehemiah chapter, no, it's not Nehemiah. I always get this mixed up. Um, where is it? It's going to be in, uh, yeah. Haggai chapter two. Is that it? No, well, maybe it is in Nehemiah. Where is it? Um, well, oh, well, one place we have it anyway, I know, is Ezra chapter chapter 10. Remember, it's going to be the 20th day of the ninth month, and they're going to uh, put away the strange wives, right? And it's going to be on the 20th day of the ninth month. Where is this? Verse nine. And then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month and the 20th day of the ninth month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. So that's the time in which they're going to have 
the reign, the 20th day of the ninth month is uh, in 457 BC. That date is December. I'm trying to remember what the date was. Yeah, it's it's almost, uh, I'm sorry. Maybe that's going to be, yeah. So it's technically, it's actually in January. So that's going to be like January 6, 456, right? <clears throat> so 457, just after 457 just ended. So um, so you can see that's when the rain is going to be. It's going to be in December, right? So if you went back to like 20 days earlier, it's going to be like mid-December even that the ninth month begins. So it's usually the ninth month that you get most of the rain. Okay. Um, anyway, we... Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the Sabbath and for the time that we could have contemplating your word together and the time we have for the rest of this Sabbath. We pray for your presence, your Holy Spirit, to bring Christ to us and that we can have his presence throughout the day. Bless each person. May your angels watch over them. And bring us together again to study your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.